start recording. Okay, so recording has started. And I'm actually using OBS Studio. So this is uh, first time. Checking it out. I tested it and it looks really good. It uh, looks like the voice quality was really good. No problems on any issues. So that's a good suggestion. Actually, definitely recommend it. It's easy, pretty easy to set up and everything. So definitely pleased with it so far. Um, okay, so let's let's go to the current meeting. Uh, for Tuesday, the 28th, 2019. Now let's see, we're kind of locked out of editing it. Okay, so let me just keep um, speak, speak what I wanted to say today as far as the update. Uh, so we're moving forward on organizing for the, the Steam Camp, the Open Source Microfactory Steam Camp for everybody. And that announcement there is up on the opensourceecology.org website. And we just added actually a, a video. So William was here for a week preparing. So we've got about 31 days left in terms of the countdown. Uh, early bird registration ends this Friday. But we put up a video uh, describing in brief what, what the event is about. And it's the first time that we're doing a, a design-focused event where it's about now shifting from, okay, this is what open source ecology is producing to, okay, here are the tools for you to design and build things. So, so really a nice crash course. And along with that, so you can take a look at that, you can look at the curriculum. Uh, the crash course includes 18 lessons on very basic design topics like, like what all goes into a machine at a fundamental level, fundamental level. What are the primitives that, that everything is made of? And that's essentially frames, power units, motors, engines, there's gear downs, power transmission. There's, there's a bunch of fundamental units that if you understand them, you can build structures and then power them through motion or then electronics and controllers and precision motion as well. So that's, that's included in what we'll be teaching on uh, in about a month that's coming up June the 28th. Uh, people are arriving on the 20th, but starting the June 29th through July the 7th. So it's a nine-day immersion. So I want to point out to some of the most recent work on the OSC machine design guides. So this is kind of a big section that OSC machine design guides. Let me go back to my log. What's, what did I type wrong? Okay, OSC machine design guide. Uh, it doesn't have an S there. Uh, so 18 topics. So so now breaking down all the curriculum from the, the workshop that will be in the form of easy to access 18 lessons, about an hour each, each formatted nicely in our cover. So this is, I'm going to start off with collaborative literacy because that's actually a very important thing. And, and over the years we found that how important the ability to collaborate between different people is and it's one of the big cultural barriers as we live in a competitive economy uh, based on violence and warfare I mean it's it is a big challenge when you when you actually think about it so some of the things I'll be talking about and I mean the first thing to, to learn about is the psychology of collaboration and how people behave based on uh, personal issues and that's things like esteem ego vulnerability the threat of survival that the tiger is going to eat us you know people are still quite afraid of many different things our psychology is pretty much like uh human psychology on a gut level is um in a flight and flight fight and flight response that's like thousands hundreds of thousands of evolution that our brain is still wired up like that and, why, and that's why we can't collaborate we still think some someone's going to eat us so that's deeper issues there but Anyway, the, so the design guides will feature all the details that we need, you know, starting like things like frames, universal axes, motors, uh, stepper motor controllers, Marlin based drive, tool path generation, that's for CNC machines, gear downs for power, 3D printed extruder design. So if we focus on a 3D printer, we want to know how to design an effective extruder because that's the core tool head of a, of a 3D printer. There's shafts and bearings, couplers, pulleys, belts, sprockets, and screws. You got to know some calculations like force and torque, structural calculations, thermal calculations. Then there's basic circuits for making all kinds of electronics 
uh, assist to whatever we're building. Then there's hydraulics, the high torque, high power motion kind of elements, like for tractors or heavy duty CNC machines. Heater elements are relevant for many things from the heaters and extruders and filament makers and extruder proper uh, or like even melting metal or other things uh, with uh, electric heating. And then CNC machine design will basically cover what are the main, so if you've got frames and precision motion systems, what are the main features of, of a given device? Like what's a 3D printer need to do? What does a CNC torch have to do? What are the critical elements that differentiate it from differentiate that particular tool head and the infrastructure support that it requires from any other uh, machine? Because there's certain, like after you have the frame and, and motion uh, and the tool head, there is also some specific support. Like for example, for a CNC torch table, uh, possible support would be a water bed where uh, the metal actually lays on top of it so that the water cools off the metal as you're cutting so it doesn't warp, things like that. So each device will have particular features, like for example, a heavy duty CNC mill might have, have lubricant or cooling, uh, something that sprays the parts so that the cutting can take place with less friction and less heat. So there's unique properties and we'll go over through all of them what, what those are for many different devices. Uh, but besides that, we're getting ready for the event, put out some marketing on that, just uh, pub keeping on publishing that. So sign up for that at Open Source Microfactory Steam Camp. Okay, so but that's really about it for me. Uh, I'm continuing to work on a printer. We're going to uh, prototype some of the axes elements, get all the materials, so a lot of preparation on that, including uh, doing the internet here. So we've got the fast gigabit internet and we need to trench to all the buildings and, and spread the internet throughout because we've got one gig line and we're going to have for the first time a really effective internet so others could collaborate. So actually some people have also signed up for the remote version of the workshop. We do have actually a remote option under the registration or if you want to just view the 18 lessons and some of the presentations within the workshop, uh, you can do that. Um, and it's going to be myself, William, Neil and Katerina uh, presenting throughout this so should be a good event okay but that's it for me and I'm gonna go back to to doing prep work uh, so maybe let's hear from some updates Abe do you have do you have any updates there yeah. it's working Like on merchant. Yeah. Hey, Benny, any updates on, on that? Merchant? What's up? Sorry. Oh, hey. Sorry. Hey, are you there? Can hear me now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Cool. Okay. Okay. I had I missed a sound setting. Okay. So, yeah, I've been working on the the more of the CAD for the three D PVC style frame assembly and stuff like that. But uh, I started doing a lot of uh, looking at the simple extruder. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a work in progress. And so I've been taking a bunch of notes and things in my working doc, uh, about lots of different ideas. I just scribbled in there, but, um, I've got a bunch of taking a bunch of notes on the, on the simple extruder and things like that. And I, I know it's a work in progress and I do some of the cat and everything. And they source look, micro it's so simple that, um, yeah, I, I can see that be 
being easy to just build, actually, for the most part. Um, and and there might, actually, I've done some things that it might be more simplifiable. It looks like there's different options in that design, uh, but that, that, that's an interesting design. So, <clears throat> it, and I guess some of the CAD, there, there's students still working on that. Uh, the factory scene. Some of it probably needs a bit more work, but and there's some pictures that I noticed in some of the documentation and the Google Drive. I see photos of things, but I don't think that, I see photos of CAD, but then the CAD files aren't actually there yet. So uh, I, I guess it, it's a work in progress, obviously. So um, we'll just have to get uh, think it with William more on that. I don't know the um, and, and what they. It is ongoing on that, uh, or I don't recall. I, recall, I, I can't remember which students um, are working on that. And I know that's probably a, maybe a periodic thing. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I, I had some um, thinking about the frame. I hadn't been finding a lot of research on putting like concrete in PVC tubes, at least for small PVC tubes and, and some of the, you know, I think there'd be information about that that's frequently done for larger pipes for various purposes. But uh, I did finally search up more stuff. I found a whole thread on the RepRap site on, you know, the, being concerned about just plastic printable frames and that kind of thing and more advanced designs of that. And there was kind of information there that was interesting about uh, yeah, plastic tube style frames are just filling with stuff and they have tensioned and compressed and strained frames. Some people did build they were fairly simple. Uh, they were different kinds of CNC machines okay. and printers, I think a Delta one of them was. <clears throat> okay. But I did find more information okay. Okay. Yep. about concrete infill and and some people were infilling with sand and then sand and epoxy mixes and things like that and it was suggested that even just spray foam into mm. the pvc was adding quite a bit of stiffness i saw some comments on that uh so but i was thinking that infill concrete might not even be the thing i some other information when it comes to was about stressing pipes if if you can compress or tension you know a pipe uh you, you can increase the stiffness quite a bit. And I, I don't find out the details about physics, about that. I, I don't know what information. There, there should be quite a bit of architectural engineering information about that kind of thing, too. But it's probably a little different scale. But I was thinking that might almost be easier to, to design it so that you could run filament or wire through the frame in some way and maybe tension the frame and adjust it that way. And then you could still take the whole thing apart again. Yeah. And nothing would be cool together. But um, so I'm, I'm kind of more interested in that. I, I keep thinking a smaller frame would be better. But in some ways, looking at, at John's uh, frame D3D Ohio, um, a little bit, I'm trying to get more access to information on that. Uh, the, the frame, the bigger that way with the bolts in some ways is simpler. Uh, the clamp is nice, and I think the clamp will work, even if it needs adjustment, as long as it holds tight on, on all on the main four top four corners. As long as it doesn't slip much, it'll be okay. But in some ways, making a larger frame instead of a smaller frame, as long as you've got cheap plastic, seems okay too. And then you wouldn't have to print as much plastic. And of course. Until if we had huge printers to print the entire frame, then you might as well just print bolt holes into plastic tubes and assemble it that way with just bolts, and the clamp would no longer be necessary. But um, we'll, we'll see. I'm going to get some about 20 feet of PVC uh, here this week and hopefully do some testing with some of the extra pieces of that, and um, I, I will try some infill and maybe some tension tests i think i have some ways to just start testing some of that stuff yeah we'll have time to do that so um <clears throat> yeah actually guys i'm um, sorry about this but uh, actually we, we just uh there's a we got a message that there's a flash flood warning here i actually gotta go down to the workshop and do 
um, do a little work around the outside. We have some massive, massive rains here. Um, I'm going to need to go actually, but you can continue and continue talking because I'm still recording this on OBS Studio, but we just got this, it just came out like five minutes ago. So that means it's a little, uh, um, like it's, it's focused on this area right now. So actually, okay, well, yeah. But uh, okay. keep going. I'll, I'll, I'll keep recording. So I'll, I'll get back later, like in an hour or two. Uh, if I gotta do some work around the greenhouse, do some actually digging around it, because um, we're like pretty close to flooding. Okay. We'll okay, bye. I gotta get going now. Sorry about that. So Abe, uh, you're building this structure out of PVC tubing. Abe, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the frame. What was the point of doing that? Can't we just use aluminum or something? Aluminum? Well, some of that is, is cheaper plastic. Aluminum is, of course, square stuff, and usually they use these expensive, you know, those different extrusions. I know there's a variety of open extrusions. But PVC is, is pretty cheap and simple. And, um, yeah, but I mean, aluminum, can't... we can't extrude that yet, so obviously that that's... Mm -hmm. Complicated. I don't know how much stiffer aluminum is. Plus, it's, it's square. But I mean, none of the the printers or anything so far is built off of aluminum because of probably just mostly the the cost. Uh, and that's the the frame. Uh, I've seen some of the frame kits on online. And, uh, looking through a lot of the the printer kits. Uh, I think the steel one looks pretty good. Like that steel lab just cut. That works. It looks like it's pretty sensible. Yeah, the the steel uh, for just the the standard D three D that March is building all of them out of is really nice because it's well, it's it's square, you know, pieces that are cut and they're solid. I, I was looking at the the other day too and thinking it's unfortunate we can't make a simple or uh, well stock steel is just really hard to build a frame out of because you'd have to bolt it together in too many points that's a lot harder than you did still you, you really need those square pieces of You know, uh, there's a long history of making machine tools out of polymer concrete, which is uh, kind of like the epoxy full of sand they were talking about. Uh, heard you said something about concrete, but I'm having a hard time with um, your audio. Um, there's a long history of making machine tools out of polymer concrete. Polymer concrete is a mixture of 80% sand and 20% oh. uh, uh, yeah, polymer. Polymer. The bendable okay. and and same thing they use for tile and other more flexible concrete. Yeah, I, I've worked no, with no, concrete no, no, quite no. a bit. And no, I it's not that. Know. It's not that. It's um, it's called polymer concrete. It's a different type. It's a concrete. Technically, it's anything which is a binder mixed with an aggregate. So you have the aggregate, which is sand in this case, and then there's the uh, polymer material, which is usually thermoset polyurethanes. It could be epoxy okay. too, though. I think you're saying the the aggregate of the polymer. So the the mixing plastic for lightweight concrete. No, it's not lightweight concrete. It's called polymer concrete, and it's twenty percent polyurethane and eighty percent sand. And there's a long history of making machine tools out of it. So uh, this idea of simply filling the tubes with polymer concrete isn't such a bad idea, really. I mean. Does that make sense? Can you hear me okay? Uh, it, the audio is pretty choppy on my end, but um, yeah. I, yeah, I think I understand. So there's different aggregate mixes of, uh, uh, I heard you say polyurethane. So yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense. Okay, so it's a plastic concrete mix. Yeah, I think I said, I read some of those people that were mixing, uh, yeah, different resin or two part epoxies into. Um, uh, uh, sand and things like that to do different forming too, but 
I, a lot of that just seems like it's might be over complex depending on what the, the issues with of course with doing some kind of frame or infill is it's not just stiffness but dampening effects because printers printers have that the vibration i was looking at a video earlier about vibration testing and resonance and printers uh, on the cnc machines it, it can be an issue occasionally so mm -hmm. you know there's apparently there's certain parts people print that tend to to resonate um, I was thinking, of, actually, if it, if it was tensioned with um, a wire or filament uh, with a hollow, a hollow tube structure like that, then technically you could actually tune it. <laughs> I'm sure there's, there's lots of ways to do that. You, you just tighten yeah, the, the bolts on your on your printer. It is what one of those videos sounded like. You just kind of tweak things a little, and it'll change the resonance. Obviously, if you're having resonance problems with a certain part, but uh, yeah, I've been on the tension it, and I'm curious about the effects of the tensioning larger pipes because um, I was thinking we have issues with scaling up the printer and the, the actual rods for the for the rails not the frame um, you see some designs for CNC with um, conduit and things like that but it's gonna have a certain amount of sag at some point and flexibility so I, I don't know how I didn't find enough math on it yet, but if you can tension or compress the uh, uh, pipe that way, it might add some stiffness and and some dampening effects. Okay, I guess yeah. It doesn't sound like the best way to. I don't. I don't know it. what the math is on that. Like you know what. Um, what the scale of the effects are for length and all that kind of stuff and how much force you would have to tension things with. Um, but I, I think it can be done with wire and I, I think too that there's monofilament of course are super strong hundred hundreds of pound test monofilaments and I guess there's other films which I suppose if we had a precise enough extruder uh, as I understand you could extrude that pretty easy it's mostly sounds like temperature control and the size size of the hole with the right polymer mix for the plastic i guess but uh, like what's the real goal here i mean the dc decent printer seems like a fairly good printer already and they're trying to improve on that further i suppose to make a cheaper printer that still works well Yeah, I, I'm not, I haven't seen the, I've seen some of the results from, from the prints on D3 and everything. And of course, it all depends on what speed and what accuracy considering printing that. So, yes, no, no, I think that, I don't know what kind of industry standards there are for uh, determining print, but it seems like maybe maybe there's a need for some open standards for uh, well, the discerning like tests to show I mean, there's benchies, obviously, but it seems like maybe some industrial type tests, which I'm sure there are certain things in industry they, they can print to test. Like, I see people printing more useful things like not living hinges, that those break easy, but that, that is something that's probably hard to print in some cases. But I've seen things like operational uh, pin hinges and stuff like that that would be difficult to print. And that might be a good way to test precision and, and speed because obviously, you know, the approaching getting the D3D to more uh, uh, professional quality is, is uh, it's probably, you know, a matter of speed. And I don't know what the speed and in, in comparative results are. So that's one thing. It seems like some standards or something uh, Have you would been be able good to benchmark to the D3D in its current state. Uh, yeah, what standards measure speed and precision. I mean, there's so many different D3D designs, you know, now. Well, the latest uh, one and it keeps improving because Martian keeps testing it with different different extruders and, and better drivers and so on. Uh, so a lot of that, you know, it's going to have some effect on the quality. I don't, I don't have experience with that yet, but I am I'm planning to to build. The, the PVC thing and try and if it doesn't go, go well enough you can fill it with epoxy later right 
<laughs> you can always include what it later. Why don't you just go ahead and build it and see if it works, and then if it works, but it doesn't work well enough, then you can fill it with epoxy mixtures, or you can reinforce it with wire. Epoxy? Yeah, the epoxy the, sound. Yeah, I, I think so that epoxy is of engineering, but then you have to work with the one. Um, I, I don't know what the effects of the different materials are. I guess it's, I, you know, the, the stiffness and dampening. I guess that's a question that needs to be tested and compared somehow. So yeah, well, you can um, build a prototype, basically, right? Do you have a workspace to work I'm, in? I'm, do, do I have what? Do you have a place to build the prototype and stuff? Um, I I can't make out your audio. It's still. Do you have a place to build the prototype? Hmm. Uh, maybe oh, no. type. Maybe it's not working. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, for some reason the audio is very extra choppy. I don't know why it always seems like my audio works okay the other way, but it's like the download is worse. I understand that. Or my link to, hmm. See that's. Yeah. So yeah, I have a bunch of ideas about modifying testing the parts yeah I, I'm 20 feet of uh, scale uh, and I only need like 12 feet for a small frame and I was thinking maybe even combinations of stuff in the frame would be okay because you know, it might balance the weight or, or something I think a lot of the stiffness and some of the strength of the frame a lot of it's going to come from mounting all the um the axes on it which is partly why i'm concerned about not bolting the axes directly to it with those clamps uh, john's frame it sounds like his works well uh and it's i think it's 16 inches or more Oh, FEM, or FEA, yeah. Uh, huh. Yeah, I haven't learned to use the uh, uh, finite element analysis in that. That's an interesting way to do that ahead of time, I guess. It, um, I, I guess the it depends on what materials it can do and how accurate that is. I understand the the finite element analysis stuff is it it's going to be you know based on how well you can actually model the the actual material and forces which you know that's complicated usually so you're talking about um fusion fusion 360 i don't know what its capabilities are It looked pretty easy to do some of that in FreeCAD, and I did a little bit of modeling, but I assume there's a lot more setup, and you have to know how it works in order to um, get it to do the analysis relatively accurately. And of course, I assume it's it's only good to uh, you know a certain percentage or so many decimals. And, you know, it's approximate to real world, depending on what sort of Testing obviously it's just a static and not like a dynamic load testing or, or a, a finite element analysis. So I guess it's good for for just measuring the flex and in materials.
Yeah, it seems to me uh, the the building empirically a lot of times is just easier. Just get some PV that might actually be just take less time than, than trying to do some of the cat stuff sometimes, but it's useful to do both. Um, I don't have a, an exact schedule, but I'm hoping to, to I keep thinking, well, I'd like to finish it pretty quick this, this summer, but, and, you know, get something working, but I'm thinking I'll piece it together and, and test, you know, maybe the whole thing. Uh, I don't even have hardly any parts, although I have a lot of tools and equipment and some, some parts around, but I'll probably reorder some of my parts, electronics and so on for just general use. But um hoping to, to build it pretty soon this this summer, but there, there might, there's those delays and stuff. I keep having to figure out uh, different attachment points and it, it's going to require a lot of testing. That's mostly what it is. It, it's a development prototype really. So I expect it to, I, I'm skeptical of a bunch of different aspects of it and I keep questioning some of the designs on that the frame, but I kind of like the the way I've set up the, the axes so far. I don't know how many hours. I'm, I'm hoping that I can get the CAD, you know, pretty th thorough, assuming there aren't too many changes uh, after the fact. But quite a few hours just developing simple things like the clamp, and we'll see how well that works. I, I, it's still an interesting part, but a lot of little things take, take a lot of time. So I have quite a few hours in it already over the last few months. Uh, but um, hoping I, I can accelerate the build, um, and I'm hoping I can do it within. I assume the assembly will take so many days, but I I'll probably assemble it split more than once to test different things. So that that's the the question. Um, it, it may take a few months, so. That could be, it could be, I don't know if it'll be a hundred hours, but, you know, hopefully I can do it in less than that, hopefully 50 or something, but um, not counting the previous time, but yeah, yeah. So I figure if I actually get in 10 hours, you know, like the OSC stuff uh, a weekend or something, um, it, it may take, you know, a month or so just, just maybe to do first test or something. But I, I know the softwares are due because John is still, it looked like he had lots of tweaking on the software that since it's kind of custom, that may take longer too, but just the frame stuff, hopefully, I, I don't even know how to, I've looked at the Marlin code. And I'm familiar with the Arduino ID. Actually, I'd kind of like to use it. It looks like people are switching to the platform IO IDE, which I assume is in Atom, which I use. I've tried to use it with Arduino, but I think I had some issues on, on Linux. But um, that the code hopefully isn't too much of a hang up. But I, I try to get 10 hours a week on stuff, and that, that's not always the case. But Hmm. Uh, hoping I can um, get it working and then go back to doing CAD for other stuff too because yeah yeah let's what are you working on um Well, uh, I was wondering about the future of open source and you know, open source technology in general.
I assume that your audio is recording well on, on margins and probably it always seems okay in the videos. So you could probably talk about it and I could watch it later and everybody will want to hear. Uh, instead of just the text, it's... Yeah, I think before I think I think you were talking to Marchin um, the other day, and you can talk more about it maybe too, just audio and the type as well. Um, but the the workshops, it sounds like there's a lot of overhead for them on stuff, and so that sounds like some of the issue. And of course, maybe they need more help there all the time. But it sounds like too, Marchin was saying that. Occasionally, it's been down on having like more of a um, a villager, a coffee people, kind of you know they don't want to have issues with the structure there at the farm. But it sounded like you wanted to get more, more people there again, and I guess I guess they they have enough room, but probably and they have buildings and stuff a lot, a lot already, so there could be a number of people there, but. I guess it depends on on how you get people to do that. Uh. Hmm. Yeah, I. I suppose that the hard part that LC already has the initial infrastructure because they don't need to begin with. And that's a lot of it. That's initial. You, I mean, how do you start kind of without that? Of course, as much as they need to bootstrap things better. And that's, that's hard. I mean, we don't have enough, um, the machines in the micro factory stuff does have to like, be good enough to certain points so that people can actually use it for, for business stuff. So, I imagine you, I don't know. I don't remember what the funding was on um, the initial setup for OCO. Obviously, they put a lot into infrastructure, and they have, you know, the the, the welders and all the equipment. Um, they have is pretty expensive to begin with. Sometimes I think well, they could have got more stuff, but it. People is going to cost. It's usually labor costs are usually higher, right? So it, one way or another, even if you get people to work cheap, um, or or pay to come to workshops, uh, that it's still kind of costly. I guess that's that's some of the issues they're having, but. Yeah. Schooling, um, which which is the direction that you can sort of take it is it's an educational campus and get people to come to an educational campus. But yeah, if the people are productive, then yeah, it's it's scalability. Um, have to produce enough stuff. That's why I'm, I'm hopeful. Um, I mean, Marcin keeps talking about producing different things. I know that's hard when I don't have the people for him to keep up with and for them to do just a few people there. It's hard for them to run any kind of actual business. So they have to bootstrap something. And I know that it's probably more probably more interested in doing the administrative stuff and it's always been that they want to get other people to replicate the business stuff so yeah um, you know so talks about products and the open source everything store I guess there's a lot of things that could be produced uh, to support I guess a campus but it, it, Marketing. I think that the printer replication stuff—it's it, kind of hard because it 
it's limited market, but there's people always go with easier easier stuff. People will go buy the Prusa. <laughs> Not the old, but because those are real expensive. Except for maybe businesses might buy those more expensive 3D printers more readily because it's it's a it's an easy ecosystem uh, to just adapt adapt something. And Lulzbot sounds like they're a really good example of a of an actual functional open source business. They're apparently fairly transparent in all of their business and. Open source and the printers probably more so than Prusa. And hmm. uh, first of all, most of all the Lulzbot printers are really expensive. I I don't know how to compare them. Um, this is like there's so many printers optional to people that want to build their own. Either do it, and you get. They always. It seems to me that the workshops always do work out. They always get a lot of people to come to the workshops. Um, most everything so works well. I guess it's it's how difficult is the workshop to set up when you only have a few people initially. Yeah, so I think the theory behind the D3D is, I don't know, improve on the drawbacks. I think a lot of it is usually cheaper, and cheaper isn't always necessarily better or more sustainable, but that, that's like the starting point. Um, you know, I, I, there has been a shift. I think Merchant Keeps Up More is a shift to more off-the-shelf parts so that it's easier, and there's so much supply for these cheap printer parts now that's, not that difficult, but um, m most any these printers seem like they're good enough for most things. So uh, it's not just the 3D printers; it's it's the plastics recycling. That that does seem like a potential business, but I, I don't know how that that scales. You have to get people interested in it. Um, of course, we know. Um, it, it seems to be popular in other places like uh, Holland. Um, Dave Dave Hacken seemed to have scaled that out to some extent. I don't know how much they probably have. Uh, they probably do have a bunch of subsidies on that, but I, I don't know. I haven't looked at that lately. Um, details of the precious plastics. Yeah, the printer, it's got to distinguish itself, which the easy one is like easy to build kits, which the only thing that's hard about the metal frame, it's nicest of really gone to metal frames and you have to cut those and produce them. And that's the only significant, I think, other cost. Otherwise, all the parts are, all the parts are fairly cheap. I don't know about the quality. I think you know, John said peppers that he ordered first, they were cheap and not good. And so um, I'm a little concerned about that. I'm trying to talk to John more, but the, the printers, um, I buy the D3D printer. Yeah, I thought about the D3D printer, but I figured try to produce something, um, the different, a slightly different design with this PVC or something might be useful in designing other parts. I think of the, the universal axis is pretty nice, but I'm sure that there's pros and cons. I haven't worked with it enough or any 3D printers enough to know exactly. So I figured I'd start with something real simple and that, that will uh, make it easier to just kind of learn a whole bunch of stuff fairly quickly. Yeah, the, the people, I guess they're trying to sell them in um, uh, oh, the fellows. The fellows were trying to sell them before. So how do you think you're going to sell them? Uh, 
Um, I guess if I, I, if it was like a better one and I didn't want to spend the time to put it together, I probably would. I mean, I'm kind of interested in the one to start with just to, to learn about it. Cause building them is a great way to learn about it. If you don't know, I mean, that's kind of the workshop model too. Yeah. The, the printer business, I, I, um, there, there's so much cheap stuff in China, and if people are interested, they people tend to just buy something. But uh, I guess it depends on how easy the kits are. I think that's a lot of it's the logistics, which the manual for the D30 is looking pretty good, a lot better. They did a lot of work on that. Um, I think there's a bunch of things that have been simplified in the build. The, the magnets surprisingly didn't work out, so I think things have keep changing on that a lot of it is probably how easy if it's a kit if you're selling a kit then it's how easy it is to assemble and support and all that yes um i was thinking that it would go well like the with the with the oc fell trying to do workshops and sell them that way and for whatever reasons that that didn't pan out as well so I don't know I, I figured in a, in a high population area right marketing it would K you know at least it would have been um, yeah yeah I think that's been discussed up with the fellows I mean the main thing it sounded like was they couldn't get enough people to sign up for the workshops and maybe no workshops. I think be the the popular for certain, I guess business stuff. It sounds like maybe individuals aren't as interested in coming to workshops, and it's not like the targeting towards more like education and stuff was more popular because those kind of professional uh, groups tend to do that stuff more like, like, you know, businesses or, or organizations will send their people to those kinds of things to learn about stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Demand for building the kit in a workshop is a small fraction of people who want a printer. Yeah. And I don't see that, Printers aren't necessarily ever going to be a huge demand for everybody. I mean, you see lots of expensive, different machines targeting like small business to build. Like you know, they're doing the lasers. They're all proprietary all the time. But um, people that have the money for small business, they'll eventually go with those easy proprietary solutions. So. Uh, but the, a lot of times solutions have to be good enough to to best those in some ways. It's hard to get up. And a lot of the open source stuff does work well, and sometimes it's actually the software. But um, I, obviously the hardware, the, the whole ecosystem of hardware and like the global village construction set machines or even just the micro factory isn't there yet. So it, it is a, uh, not a product. It's kind of a, there's some chicken and egg issues, but um, you kind of have to have things good enough before you get to a certain point before people will take it seriously, I guess, or enough percentage of uh, people will want to buy into the concept. Yeah, I guess. Okay, well, I should go. It was good talking to you, though. Yeah, there's a lot of people working on this stuff. So, I mean, it, you see a lot of um, that stuff, yep. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, good discussion. I do need to get going, too. Yeah, I, I don't know. There's people making necessarily a living out of people that may be making 
money who have other businesses and shops and they're making like they're doing maker stuff right uh they're doing the youtube things and and showing off the printers and the making of printers and extruders and all this equipment you know online and that's that's advertising they're doing it that way a little bit but i don't think they're making necessarily a lot that way either it's like a side it takes a lot of time and work too and it's just the whole video concept uh like on youtube or something that's that's like a whole nother job or something it sounds like um so it's like they gotta have a small business that that makes demographics for that seem narrow as well hmm. so yeah so the fundamental engineering do you mean like CAD, or do you mean like empirical testing and yeah part so you want to engineer like the basic parts to build the stuff like like maybe for more cnc equipment and things like that is that what you're saying I think that's kind of kind of what I see in long term is is the, the there's a need for catting all that stuff up and it's open. Um, Cuz I know I was kind of surprised that I don't think that at factory farm in the shop I don't think that they actually have a large um, uh, CNC mill. Well, they have certain things, but they don't have a, um, uh, you know, like a full shop mill that you can then use to bootstrap and build everything else. Because if you have like a uh, a lathe, is what I mean, not just a mill, but a, a lathe or anything, I guess it's because you turn screws and make bolts, right? You can build anything if you can do that. So I, I was kind of surprised that it didn't start with that, but. Um, Making certain machines first sometimes does seem like uh, a good idea. Yeah, the maker spaces are popular in the right areas, um, and I, I think there's some even around universities and so on, uh, some small ones. But sometimes they're not even there to. Um, a lot of them don't even necessarily have that much public access, I've noticed, but at least in areas that they have to be a, a significant population center to make that a viable business is what it seems like. Yeah, so I, it, it's in the in fundamental engineering, too, and I, I don't know how to, you know, the, that's hard to, to get money out of too, but um, yeah, I, I, I need to go as well. So we'll we'll have to discuss any more of this another time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I could keep talking a little too, but I, I do kind of need to to get out during the day and do certain things. So, um, yeah, I mean, we could go on. A lot of this stuff gets gets discussed a lot of the time, and and I don't know if, without numbers and specifics, demographics. You know, felt this point's not easy, and that's eventually what needs to be done. So it's like, you know. Open source business, even if you're open source in a business plan, the problem is it's never going to be the same for any demographic or region. It's it's a very um, different thing for probably everybody that's going to try to do a business in a different area or something like that. So.
Yeah, it's hard to discuss some of those, those things. Um, we can't have enough detail. I mean, we can generalize about it. But... Yeah, the just the two million bucks. I, I guess if this would cost to replicate. Um, you know, uh, an OSC, um, kind of a, a whole platform, to land everything, um, equipment to start with, and infrastructure, all that. But it, do you end up with the same issues? You know, it's. Yeah, keeping people engaged is, is hard because people just, even you have a campus with educational stuff that there's lots of volunteer educational stuff, I think, where they constantly get students and people to come through, engineers, maybe even some experts occasionally, uh, like with Open Source Ecology or other organizations that volunteer around the world, just, you know, doing uh, things like that. See, big question: What to do? I mean, that there's, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Open source hardware is is rather unique. I mean, there's all kinds of volunteer organizations that do uh, different volunteer operations, and I don't know that they've adapted open source that much either that's probably a whole nother problem but cuckoo's more i'm not sure i'll have to look that one up hmm Google is not. Google didn't find that Kukuk small. Okay. Maybe. Hmm. Where? Okay. So Kukuk small is a German thing. Okay. Maybe I know how to spell. If I search on that, I'll find it. But um, So that's a hacker space in Germany. That's interesting. Hmm. There are, um, well, I, I've seen other projects and sites and things related. I think sometimes OSC has worked with some of those 
just just like websites where people post certain stuff that's open like farm hacks and things like that but nobody does like a thorough hundred you know around open hardware uh you know development concept so I almost think that that are probably getting closer to some some of the opening the machines and things like that, just because of individual work on projects. Um, I mean, just rep rap already did so much on its own. It's like the individual organizations people get into those groups and do stuff online, and and so eventually, you know, there, there's these open source projects just to do a specific thing. And eventually, they keep getting some of those machines, and people just aren't necessarily all that aware. Yes, too. Hmm. Yeah, the land base. Hmm. Hmm. Let's see, the farm bot, that's the gantry thing. Those things are expensive, but yeah, I can see them being okay. Um, you know, if, if that's something that's productive but machines for so that farm stuff it's kind of interesting on some scale but at some point you know great people can just learn to to do certain things without the <laughs> the CNC sometimes um, yeah physical hmm yeah the physical place that gets gets people to to come um, But a, a lot of the, the open source stuff has been done mostly just remotely online. But th there are serious limitations. I mean, just like this audio issue. And, and a lot of times in the meetings and stuff, I have to go back through things. And that takes more time because remote collaboration is pretty imperfect. Um, you have to read through all everybody else's documentation. So that that's avenges the workshops. People can immediately collab collaborate on something and really get it done fast. Yeah, yeah. If if it needs to be a group build of the machine, then yeah, you need a physical place. If it's not something a person can build by themselves, although it's surprising how many people, a few people will do that. <laughs> They'll just find plans is build stuff on their own and there's plenty of people that build stuff on their own all the time from you know scratch almost uh and don't open source it too or or they share the plans but it's not really open source yeah yeah they, they're just you know individuals and maybe one person builds it and then nobody else ever replicates it so and usually it's because the documentation isn't perfect or people don't ever build it the same yeah yeah a lot of cnc machines being built i see more now i think it is driven by the base open source stuff that's more available like the software and the hardware is good and cheap and available in awful lot of places but A lot of people just don't know what open source is. I mean, they, they're confused by it. I talk to people all the time and say, what well, does it be open source? And they don't know. They just think it means published. So it's even just that educational barrier right there. <laughs>
Yeah, and it seems like Factory Farm and LSC could be the physical location for people to go develop any time or I mean I mean full time that comes with the complexity of having everything else um, yeah you've got to have a full business model and some of the issues too is it um, if you combine the, the farm concept with the the, the other business stuff I, that makes things somewhat more sustainable too because um yeah i mean your basic resource is food <laughs> at least and other things so that um having a farm that's functional uh, covers some of that and people can spend time on all those things but you have to get people to to do that concept at the physical location <laughs> Reduces costs, right? Um, okay, can, well, uh, I think I might as well go Abe here a bit. Um, it was good talking, though. Uh, keep thinking about this sort of thing, right? Yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, good discussion. Um, Arsley, well, hopefully some of that got on the recording besides just me. Um, all right, well, yep, yeah. good, good talking to you. Talk later. Bye.